And it's my great pleasure to announce the net next speaker, who now, after technical, yeah. After some initial technical problems, is online now, and it's, it'll be Professor Amitabha Banerjee from the UCL in London, and uh, he's speaking on long COVID from known knowns to unknown knowns, and I hope we can manage to bring him online now. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Also a consultant cardiologist. Thank you very much to the organizers for um, the invitation to, to speak. I um, have been uh, thinking how, how to uh, capture all of all of what we, we don't know. And I, I thought I'd use this you know very well known um, expression that Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, talked about when he was talking about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, so these are my conflicts. I'm, I'm a, a clinical academic. Uh, I, I have various research funders uh, and I'm a trustee of various organisations, including Long COVID SOS, which, which is a, a patient-led charity in the, in the UK. So I think one of the problems that we have um, or is is um, one that's rife in in medicine that we work in silos, and when we have uh, diseases that affect different systems, that challenge our communicable versus non communicable ideologies, then we are stuck in our silos. You know, so silo for for those of you who are classic scholars is is from the Latin and Greek, and, and that was how we stored corn um, and kept it separate in different pits. That we can't do when we're, we're affected by uh, a multidisciplinary, multi-system uh, disease that, that is affecting different countries. And, and that's, that falls under the realm of almost what, what we call complexity science. Also, the term pandemic uh, has been challenged by many um, commentators that we should be talking about syndemics. Of course, the infectious agent, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, the virus is, is the key instigator, but to ignore the interplay of social determinants of health, of underlying risk in terms of non-communicable diseases and non-communicable risk factors is, is naive at best. So, so it's syndemic, I would say, is how we should look at this. Uh, this is what um, Donald Rumsfeld, the, the then Secretary of State of the United States, said. He said, there are known knowns, there are things we know we know. We also know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. So let me try and use this classification. So known knowns. Well, we know that when I mention silos, these three silos of science, evidence, and care often sit um, totally separately. And whether it's brought about by electronic health record data or by ways of working, this learning health system concept of, of virtuously linking these three silos is incredibly important if we want to move quickly in this kind of cross disciplinary challenge. The other known known is that this, this sits on a, a prevention spectrum like other chronic diseases. So the best way to avoid long COVID is to avoid getting infected in the first place. That goes without saying. But most of our countries are now uh, in, in a, a, a phase where they're not actively pursuing infection suppression. Vaccination is important as a primordial prevention strategy as, as well. But failing that, it's important to recognise people early, rule out other diseases and pathophysiologies, and try to 
treat symptoms and move towards a situation where we can actually treat underlying disease and pr provide rehabilitation for people who, who need it. This concept I've um, written about um, a lot in relation to my home territory of, of cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease can be a risk factor, can be part of uh, COVID and long COVID illness and can be a, an outcome. Uh, and that fits nicely into this learning health system framework. So that's a, a bit of background for you now. In terms of the known unknowns, well, in the first wave of the pandemic, this is a pre-vaccination era analysis and 40,000 people uh, who were hospitalized with COVID and discharged. Yet at four months, 12% uh, of them had died and 30% of them had been readmitted to hospital. And there was a good amount of uh, new non-communicable disease, diabetes, MACE, which is major adverse cardiovascular events, chronic kidney disease and chronic liver disease. This was published in the BMJ. But it's not just hospitalized. Remember, most people with long COVID in all of our countries are uh, non-hospitalized. So their initial illness was not severe enough for them to be hospitalized with COVID. But again, in uh, the, this is this is analysis in the first 1,200 patients to go through our University College London Long COVID Clinic, where we we see that the functional impairment, which my which the last speaker, my colleague, was referring to, that the impairment that people suffer that's that, that's functional, uh, that that people are unable even at 12 months to return to work full time who were previously working full time and this uh, people who who were working before who were you know either retired or not working at all so even the non hospitalized group has a significant impairment we uh, conducted a study called the cover scan study so with with colleagues here from perspectum which is a company that works uh, before the pandemic in imaging uh, particularly of the liver but we developed a, a, a rapid um, multi-organ MRI sequence that can be done in 35 minutes and, and looks at all the organs except for the, the brain. And we, we were doing this uh, in the first wave of the pandemic to try and identify if there was organ impact. And we showed that, um, again, some one of the questions in the last session, that there's... Um, a, a large number of very varied symptoms. The good news is that a good proportion of people get better. So that's the dark blue bars. We, we followed people up here, I should have said, for one year. So one year, most people do get better, but a good amount of people still have symptoms at one year, whether it's fatigue, whether it's fever, whether it's joint pain. But on the bottom, there are various MRI metrics across different organs. And again, this is showing that although most of the abnormalities are mild, the dark blue bars are still present at one year. So there's there's some um, persistent multi-organ MRI detectable abnormalities. And we this study included 500 or so non-hospitalized individuals. And about 60% had single organ impairment. Uh, about 25% had um Two or more organs affected, and at twelve months, uh, th this this was was still present in about sixty percent of that sixty percent. So so this is um, a, 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 you know definitely a cause for concern in my home territory of the heart. Other than myocarditis, which is what most of the scientific community and most of the debate has been concerned with, even outside of myocarditis, one in five individuals with long COVID had um, persistent abnormalities at, at six months and half of those at 12, uh, persisted at 12 months. So on that backdrop, we set up um, a large national study called um, Stimulate ICP. Uh, the hardest bit in these kind of consortia is coming up with the acronym. Uh, so so um, I'll, I'll take the blame for that. But symptoms, trajectory, inequalities in management, Understanding long COVID to address and transform existing integrated care pathways. So we, we um, you could say, bit off more than we could chew here, but we 
using those frameworks of the learning health system and the integrated care pathway or integrated approaches to prevention, we wanted to take a holistic view rather than biting off one, one therapeutic question within long COVID. And we did it like that because my co-lead in this project, uh, Melissa Heitman at the top of the slide, is um, the, the national lead in the UK for long COVID services. But she set up the first long COVID clinic in University College London Hospital. And the model we have in the UK, when in, in England now we have over 100 clinics like this. So GPs refer people, GPs, the general practitioners, primary care physicians will um, see somebody who's got um, suspected long COVID. If they think it is long COVID, they will refer uh, to a long COVID clinic with basic investigations such as chest x-rays, such as ECG, such as basic blood investigations. They'll have a full assessment in long COVID clinic. And those that are um, able to will be referred for rehabilitation after other diseases have been ruled out. So the first work package is to look at usual care in this regard. The second work package is a complex intervention trial where uh, we firstly are looking at whether the cover scan, that multi-organ MRI that I mentioned, helps inform um, and, and increase the in efficacy of, of um, management of people with long COVID. And on the other side, we've got Living with COVID Recovery, which is a digital rehabilitation platform. So those two interventions are part of an integrated care pathway which people are randomized to in, in a cluster design at what we call the primary care network level, so that it's part of their usual care. And within this study, we've also embedded a drug platform study, uh, which initially has the had the antihistamines, loratadine, famotidine, but also it's got colchicine and anti-inflammatory and rivaroxaban anticoagulant in there. We are following people up for um, three months, six months, and then we have data linkage at, at one year, and, and they would carry on the therapy for three months. And fatigue on the fatigue assessment scale is the primary outcome, but we have a whole battery of secondary outcomes, both um, functional, psychological, and physical. And I, I'll speak more to that trial a bit later on. And the third work package is about looking at inequalities in care for long COVID from referral through to treatment, uh, trying to improve the, uh, the the case finding and referral because um, we know some, some groups and some components of the society are being missed and comparing with other long-term conditions. Uh, this, this is just to say each of those three work packages has um, sub groups and this is a, a big undertaking across many universities, hospitals, uh, industry partners and others and including policymakers. So there's epidemiology and informatics in the first work package. There's the trial for both of integrated care and drugs. Uh, and in the third part, we have mixed methods approaches to inequalities from um, interviews uh, with qualitative methods to Delphi style analyses. All of the protocols for these um, parts are um, published and available online, and you can go to our website. Uh, and, and we're, we're um, gradually um, moving towards having having results, definitely by the end of this year, if not early next year. So, just to summarise the trial, so it's a clustermized, cluster randomised uh, trial of the integrated care components i.e. the multi-organ MRI and the digital rehabilitation platform. That drug platform study is at the individual level randomization. There are six sites operating around the UK, uh, and we're adding more, more sites. Um, and this, is, this was done within the NHS system so that it's, it, it can be scalable. It's not just a research study. Uh, and and as my colleague Melissa Heitman says, that we did this because we're we're building the the plane while we're flying it. Usually, you know more about mechanism before you start this kind of drug trial. That whatever we find will tell us um, something about the mechanism as well. 
So that's why all of the drugs we've chosen, either drugs that the, the long COVID community the patients are already using and having some benefit from, but there's no trial data there. So there's the autonomic um, dysfunction, inflammation, clotting abnormalities, um, issues with mast cell activation. But what we are still in the um, hinterlands and the early stages of figuring out is what the underlying disease process is. Is it viral persistence? Is it immunology, inflammation? Is it a metabolic dysfunction picture? To date, we've recruited 800 people. Uh, we um, have over 300 in the drug trial. It's a difficult um, in, environment, uh, not just in, in the NHS, but across health systems. But we've, you know, we're, we're all recovering from a battering over the last three years. Uh, and, and that includes you know, issues for our regulators, contracts, colleagues, and so on. So it's, it's, it's not easy to do research in this environment. But um, we still hope to have recruited over 1,500 people by the end of this year and be able to answer the question for these three um, drugs and for the integrated care pathway. And we're looking to add um, antiviral arms to this study as well. Um, you know, then looking for for funding and support for that. Um, there's lots of variation across the the different clinics uh, in in the UK. Even looking at the six that we're operating in, um, in terms of clinic design, patient flow, access, and that that reflects that we as a health system, and I think that's across different countries, were focused on the acute phase of the pandemic. And so whatever was left over was, was what we could tackle long COVID with, whether it's in primary care or whether it's in secondary care. Uh, and, and in the UK, we're lucky we have relatively good national electronic health record data. I'm coming towards the end, but I just wanted to show you some mechanism data that's um, quite new. So, so we, we showed using data from the UK Biobank that uh, Hepatic steatosis and fibrosis, independently of obesity and other um, risk factors, particularly metabolic risk factors, increase the risk of infection and hospitalisation with COVID. And colleagues in my in our team have, have written about the, the the link between the liver and the heart and the brain. Interestingly, uh, when we look at our cover scan study in the first wave, uh, we saw that there was a preponderance of liver impairment. If you look, about 30% of people, um, whether it was at baseline or at one year, had liver impairment, which is higher than what we'd expect in the general population. Um, and in our interim analysis of MRI in the first 200 or so participants, we're seeing the same, if not higher, levels of liver and pancreas um, impairment. Uh, and, and we're looking at this further and we're also looking at UK Biobank to see if there's any signal pre-COVID, uh, because these patients obviously haven't been scanned before, but to see what was what was there before. But we've also got preliminary proteomics data to support this impaired um, liver metabolism picture. And so what we think of as a post-infectious disease complication, at least in a subset of people, there seems to be uh, some some metabolic process going on. And this is interesting because you may be all aware that metformin has been shown in the acute phase of COVID to reduce the incidence of long COVID. It's not been shown in people with, uh, with long COVID to have any impact on symptoms as yet, but it's opening the door to thinking about metabolic dysfunction. On, on that theme, in our electronic health record analyses at national level, if you look on the left of this slide, this is 18 million people with, with um, COVID. And on the right, just under 300,000 people with long COVID. And we're looking at mortality and hospitalization over two years. The red lines are people with established cardiovascular disease. The blue lines are people without cardiovascular disease, but increased risk, be it hypertension, diabetes, or otherwise. This is assessed with this score called the Q-risk score. Um, and what, we, what you see is that if you have cardiovascular disease, post-COVID, your mortality and hospitalization is astronomical. 
uh, it's still high even for the blue line. Interestingly, people with long COVID have low mortality, lower than the overall population, but they have a hospitalization risk, which is similar to people with raised cardiovascular risk. And if you look on the right hand side of the slide, just focusing on people with long COVID, again, it's people with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk who have raised risk of mortality and hospitalization. So the, the, the chronic disease and post infectious link is important. This is looking at, um, at the epidemiology of vaccination. And the, the red lines here represent people who are vaccinated. The darker lines are people, I'm sorry, the, the, the red lines are unvaccinated, the, the dark lines um, are vaccinated. So people who are in the red lines and unvaccinated have higher mortality and hospitalization in the COVID cohort. And the same is true for mortality in the long COVID cohort as well. This is just for the long COVID cohort, just um, a, a zoom in. Uh, and, and it seems that you, on the bottom, I'm focusing on people with cardiovascular disease. Again, if you're going to focus on a group, people who have cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk seem to, to have a poorer prognosis. Uh, there's, there's a huge cost and resource implication of the, the millions of people with long COVID around the world. In our setting, we've looked nationally and, and, and looked at control populations so the same people, historical self, before the pandemic, people without COVID before the pandemic, people who had COVID but not long COVID, and the contemporary non-COVID cohort. And the only one that's more expensive to, to deal with at system level is the people who have acute COVID, and that's because of the admission and, and critical care costs associated. People with long COVID use a lot of healthcare resource, whether it's in emergency departments or general practice. There's and, and the, that healthcare utilisation occurs um, after the initial diagnosis of long COVID. It's not that you know it gets less necessarily with time. So, so that should you know put fire in our belly to 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 do more research and more improvement to try to find out why why that is and, and tackle this this problem. So that's the, this is what the, the, I'm showing here across our six sites that. Um, after the first long COVID clinic appointment, there is there is still healthcare utilization in, in both males and females. And this this is uh, you, you know um, a, a very complicated diagram deliberately just to show you that although I've talked a lot about electronic health records, part of the magic source is to try and draw out the patterns and and clean the the data. But here, what you're looking at is in University College London, where we have um, large-scale electronic health records, we've got vaccination rates, staff levels, uh, we've got the, the political situation where a lot of our staff are on strike um, periodically at the moment. Uh, there's there's um, different resource problems in the system. And trying to superimpose what's happening with long COVID on top of that is, is not um, straightforward. So to First chair, uh, I mentioned the learning healthcare system. I think our science needs to be a lot more adaptive and, and you know, increasingly the, the commun communicable versus non-communicable paradigm is, is out of date. We need to be moving from pandemic to syndemic. For our evidence, we need to be more data-driven and patient-led, and we need to be much more um, proactive, preventive, and patient-centered in our care. In the UK, there's various policy documents that are um, alluding to the role of the learning healthcare system. So prevention's best. We've got to zoom out and be wide angle, be joined up, um, and patient-driven is the only way. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you for this really um, perfect presentation. Learned a lot. Are there questions from the auditory? Yeah, please. Oh, thank you. If you say prevention is best, we know so little about post-COVID. How can we pre do preventive uh, action? How can we actually start preventive action? 
at a given point, we have to learn much more to be preventive. Are there cues that you see to get into prevention? Yeah, thank, thank you. That's, of course, the, the um, million dollar question. So, so infection and reinfection, as I said, uh, you know, things that we've paid less attention um, to at societal level now. Um, but people who have long COVID, uh, you'll see the people who are least uh, most likely to be wearing masks and, and wanting to get reinfected because because of, of the fear of of that. I think vaccination is what I meant. And I, I also hope that some of what I've shown you about cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease prevention are things that we have an evidence-based battery of um, treatments both preventive and uh, at, at the secondary prevention level, which have been neglected over the last three years because of health system pressure. Those are indirect effects of the pandemic. In terms of long COVID itself, uh, we're still, so, so prevention is still in the, the evidence gathering, the trial stage. And I think we need more in the antiviral um, space, whether that's Paxlovid and other drugs, um, to be tested, but I, I, I think also the metabolic data that I showed you, I, I would like to see more um, large-scale um, trials of, of some of the existing drugs that are used traditionally in the cardiometabolic space for people with long COVID as well. Um, it's my great pleasure to announce the next speaker, um, who will be Professor Riza Pretorius from South Africa, Stellenbosch University. Yeah, and she's online. Um, she will refer on tiny blood clots and endothelial dysfunction. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Can you? I presume any, everyone can hear me. Um, I'm just going to continue then. So hello, everyone. Today I will be sharing with you our latest research on clotting pathologies, and I will spotlight our recent findings in COVID-19, as well as long COVID. There are just some disclosures that I would like to share. I've got various funding um, from uh, Polybar Research Foundation, Balvi Research Foundation, and our South African National Research Foundation, and the Medical Research Council in South Africa, as well as the Colonel's Funding Initiative. I do also want to acknowledge my various research collaborators. This is obviously just a very shortened list, and I'm mainly focusing on my South African collaborators, um, and also Professor Douglas B. Carroll, who's from the University of Liverpool, and we have been doing research since 2011. Various clinicians, also a team of biochemists, a team of data scientists, my PhD students, and my laboratory um, manager, Chantal Finter. I would also just like to note that MediClinic Private Clinical Hospital approved sample collection at their facilities, and this is the data that I'm going to show today. And we also received ethics from both our Stellenbosch Ethics Committee as well as MediClinic. My lab and our collaborators from various labs over the world have been identifying inflammatory molecules in circulation that might be involved in and drive pathological clotting. And we have also focused our research endeavors on studying the effects of increased circulating inflammatory molecules and how they interact with cells of the hematological system. We focus in particular on platelets and red blood cells, as well as on the clotting protein fibrinogen. We are also interested in identifying novel inflammatory molecules that might play a role in the persistent symptoms of long COVID. Over the years, we have published numerous papers that show the importance of inflammatory molecules in circulation and their role in abnormal blood clotting. I am specifically interested in platelet signaling and the role in abnormal clotting. Platelets, as you know, in circulation play a critical role in healthy blood clotting. However, they can become overstimulated and can drive pathological blood clotting if there are inflammatory molecules in circulation. 
This can also happen in the presence of viral infections, where platelets can act as important signaling entities. There is also a complex relationship between receptors on platelets and endothelial cells where circulating inflammatory molecules may bind to. As we now know, damaged endothelial cells and platelet hyperactivation are central pathologies, also in long COVID. Our research group have therefore showed these pathologies in acute COVID and also long COVID and also conditions like MECFS. In the context of COVID-19, platelets are therefore central in immune activation and general coagulation pathology, and they can form various complexes and obviously also within cells. In that case, it is known as platelet clumping. We are also interested in pathological blood clotting, as I mentioned, involving the main clotting protein fibrinogen, which is a soluble protein in circulation when you are healthy. If you focus your attention to the three cartoons shown here, on the left, cartoon A is a healthy protein structure, which has many alpha coils and few beta sheets. However, in the presence of inflammation, oxidative stress, and circulating inflammatory molecules, this structure changes where the inflammatory molecules, also spike protein, may bind to the fibrinogen proteins shown in cartoon B. Such direct protein-protein interactions may cause the alpha coils to untwist into beta sheets, as seen in C in the cartoon on the far right. We suggest that fibrinogen molecules then have a fibrinoloid structure, and we have shown this with various amyloid protein markers like theoflavin T and amitrackers. We call these fibrinoloid plasma proteins microclots. We have looked at blood clotting in acute COVID right in the beginning of the pandemic using scanning electron microscopy. We found that platelets are damaged and clump together and attach to red blood cells. The clotting proteins that is supposed to be soluble also form spontaneous microclots. In the micrographs on the far left, you can see platelets that are hyperactivated. Note the yellow arrows. In the middle are micrographs where platelets are attached to red blood cells. Note the white arrows. On the far right, you will see micrographs of spontaneously formed microclots that even glue together red blood cells. Note the blue arrows. Now with this ultra-structural pathology in mind, we took platelet-poor plasma and exposed it to our fluorescent marker, theoflavin T, that I just um, talked about in the previous slide. This bind to open hydrophobic areas in protein that are damaged. This marker was first used to identify amyloid protein in brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. However, in 2016, our research group discovered that theoflavin T also binds to misfolded fibrinogen and fibrin proteins during pathological blood clotting. Here you can see the differences in platelet-poor plasma structure in acute COVID-19 patients during the acute infection, where we compare plasma smears of these patients to that of healthy uh, participants, as well as to patients with diabetes. Here we can see microclot formation demarcated as the green signal from theoflavin T, our marker of misfolded protein. We found small areas of nearly abnormal detectable clotlets present in plasma of healthy individuals, as you would expect, and this can be seen in micrographs on the far left. More abnormal microclots were noted in plasma of individuals with diabetes. What was, however, quite significant to us was the extent of the abnormal microclots in acute COVID-19 um, plasma, as can see in the far right plate. Also note the scale bar of 10 micrometers at the bottom of the micrographs. Here are examples of platelet hyperactivation during acute COVID-19. As microscopy results are difficult to quantify, we therefore suggested at that stage a microclot and platelet grading system based on various stages of severity of both microclot activation and based on the various stages of platelet activation. Here are examples of your platelet grading system. In our experiments, hematocrit samples are exposed to two fluorescent platelet markers. The one is CD62P, which is the pinkish signal, and that is a marker for P-selectin. 
this uh, marker is either, uh, or the molecule is either inside the platelets or on the membrane, or it can be found as a soluble marker. Here we show where it is found on the membrane of the platelets and where it acts as an adhesion receptor. We also use PAC1, which is the green signal that identifies platelets through marking of the glycoprotein 2 beta 3 alpha, which is found only on platelet membranes. The micrograph plate on the left and the top row shows examples of platelets from healthier control samples. They are obviously minimally activated platelets are noted. This we demarcated to stage one. The plate shows increased platelet spreading and the beginning of clumping. The micrograph plate on the right shows platelet clumping and at the bottom, uh, the most severe uh, examples of these platelet clumps. Here is our microplot grading system shown on the left plate. Stages one and two demarcates minimal microplot formation that you would typically find in a healthy um, individual. We also suggest that the various stages can be used in a numerical scoring system that might be used in both acute COVID-19 and long COVID patients. Just for comparison, I ju just again added um, the examples of how uh, microclots look like in type 2 diabetes. Now with this knowledge in mind, we also looked closely at spike protein. In uh, 2021, we looked at the effects of addition of, of the S1 of the spike protein on clotting when we added it to healthy blood samples. Here you can see how it also um, causes microclot formation in the green signal, as you can see in, in um, the slides on the left, B and D. And A and C is the original plasma, which we then expose to spike protein. And you can also, in the pinkish signal, you can see that it also activated uh, platelets from healthy individuals. If you look at these slides, we also looked at scanning electron microscopy. And on the left, you could see red blood cells um, and, and also uh, platelets. Um, and you can also see uh, how in the presence of spike protein, the S1, as I mentioned, um, it, the a significant um, induction of um, these activated platelets and microclots are noted. These clotting pathologies with microclots um, are seen um, in, in, in these micrographs. And then we also thought, let's initiate a microfluidics experiment, which can be seen in the plate on the right. Healthy plasma do not have much microclots as you would expect. However, in both acute COVID-19, which in this case was the earlier Delta variant, significant clots are seen in our verdict system. And um, when we added spike protein, we could induce similar structured microclots. Uh, we are also very happy to, to report that um, the microfluidic system that was developed by Dr. Martin Crater at the Max Planck Institute also reported these similar type of microclots in their fluidic system. In fact, I'm very happy to report that his instrument was actually shipped to our lab um, earlier this year, and we are doing some collaborative research with Martin on uh, the structures of the microclots in his system with our population in South Africa. Recently, also together with various collaborators from the USA, we looked at microclots and platelets from the more virulent beta and delta variants, and we compared it to Omicron. Here you can see, as one would expect, uh, because Omicron is not such a severe disease, Omicron individuals in the acute phase have much less microclot formation than with the earlier beta and delta variants. However, um, if we look at platelets, we could not really see a difference between the platelet hyperactivation. Omicron seems to also cause significant platelet hyperactivation. Then obviously we know that uh, long COVID is a massive dilemma. And uh, we looked at blood samples from patients soon after we realized in end of 2020 already that there might be a, a, a dilemma with, um, with disease in long COVID patients. We also soon realized that there are persistent microclots and widespread endothelial damage as well as platelet hyperactivation in these individuals too. And we believe that these pathologies may be central in causing the widespread symptoms in these patients. And it may eventually lead to uh, conditions like tissue hypoxia that may result in many of the, or may, might be a causative reason for many of the um, symptoms that the patients have. 
here is just how we saw some of the um the microclots and platelets in, in long COVID, as you could see, significant microclot uh, formation as well as significant platelet hyperactivation. We also initiated the South African Long COVID Registry in 2021. And uh, here you can just see some of the symptoms as well as the comorbidities. And in our South African population, we don't have results that are dissimilar to the rest of the world. We, we see the same trends with brain fog, concentration issues, forgetfulness, um, constant fatigue as some of the main complaints of our patients and our comorbidities high um, on our list of people with previous comorbidities, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, rheumatoid arthritis type conditions. We also planned an experiment where we looked at proteomics of healthy plasma and type 2 diabetes, acute COVID-19 and long COVID, and our healthy and type 2 diabetes samples were stored. So we know that they would, did not have any possibility to have been exposed um, to spike protein. And we also added the diabetes samples, obviously, because we know people suffering from diabetes are more prone to severe COVID-19 symptoms. For our proteomics analysis, we prepared platelet-poor plasma from citrated blood. And as you would typical experiment, we needed to have a digestion step, which is trypsin. To our surprise, we found a visible deposit at the bottom of the econdorf in the acute COVID-19 and long COVID samples but not in the diabetes samples and also not in our healthy samples. Plasma proteins, therefore, were fully digested in controls in diabetes, and this suggested that trypsin could degrade all of those proteins, but not the proteins that are present in the COVID long COVID samples. For our proteomics, we uh, then developed a second trypsin digestion protoc protocol, and then we could uh, um, fortunately, solubilize the digest and digest the pellets. Um, we then looked at the the, the various um, proteins after the second trypsin digestion step, uh, where we could digest all of our microclots, and we detected various inflammatory molecules that were substantially increased inside the now digested microclots of patients with acute COVID as well as long COVID versus the equivalent volume of fully digested fluid of the controls in diabetes samples. Obviously, some of the, 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 the molecules that we would expect and that we obviously found were some of the fibrinogen um, molecules that we would expect there, von Willebrand factor. But of particular interest was a substantial increase of alpha-2 antiplasmin. Um, and, and that um, gave us quite an um, a interesting um, phenomenon. If we look at the clotting cascade. So as I mentioned, alpha-2 antiplasmin was significantly increased. And the reason why it's so interesting for us is the fact that alpha-2 antiplasmin is a molecule that prevents clot breakdown and it interferes with the fibrinolytic process. And that might give us some information on why the, the actual little microclots that we see in, in circulation of these individuals simply do not break down. What our um, information also gave us, our proteomics analysis also gave us, is an idea that many of the molecules that's typically in soluble form and that ELISA um, protocols or experiments would supposed to pick up will probably not be picked up because they're not in soluble form. They are actually entrapped inside the, the microclots. We also completed a larger proteomics study and all our results were confirmed. However, we were also in, in this second um, publication that we published last year, surprised to find a significant presence of antibodies entrapped inside the microclots, which gives us quite nice information about the possibility of a significant immune activation. Our findings, however, mainly in, in, from this proteomics analysis, suggest that hypercoagulation and vascular damage are key role players causing the various symptoms. Following from this research, we also revisited our stored sample and we looked at the inflammatory molecules in the soluble fraction of the blood to see if there's possibly um, a, a way to use some of these molecules. We looked at von Willebrand factor, platelet factor 4, serum amyloid A, as well as alpha-2 antiplasmin, and we also looked at E-selectin and PCAM. And those two are obviously endothelial markers. 
here you can see just some of our results um, from this study where these molecules are significantly uh, increased in alpha-2 antiplasmin, obviously our, our main interesting molecule that, uh, that was significantly increased in the soluble fraction as well. We also looked at MECFS because we know it's related to long COVID as a post-viral disease. To our surprise, or perhaps not, not surprise, I think we, we, we thought we would be getting these results, but we also found microclots in platelet-poor plasma from MECFS patients and significant platelet hyperactivation. What was, however, interesting for us is the fact that MECFS microclots are not so large in size as we found in long COVID and acute COVID. But that is not surprising because we think that the reason for the, the large plots is basically the, the presence of spike protein as well. We also found a significant number of endothelial debris in our platelet poor plasma in both MECFS and long COVID. And this is unpublished research where we added E-selectin as our marker. And here you could see that um, uh, there are these endothelial debris present and floating around in the platelet poor plasma. And here you could see our control it looks obviously we don't expect to have endothelial damage in controls. Long COVID, we do have lots of um, these debris lying around. And we found this one big um, piece of endothelial damage mark with E-selectin in our uh, MECFS samples. Uh, lots more, but this is just one of the nice pictures that um, I would like to share with you. Then the question arises, we have now looked at these samples, platelet poor plasma and platelets, uh, using microscopy, but is there a place for flow cytometry? And recently, with the help of various um, funders, we acquired an imaging flow cytometer. And here you could see some of our very preliminary results where we indeed found these microclots. Um, and we can now, in, in, with this methodology, with the imaging flow cytometer, uh, count the clots and uh, work out the area ranges. Um, of the sizes within controls and um, various patient groups. And this is just some of our um, latest research. Um, this, this paper is in preprint. We also uh, in, uh, we also looked at initi initial initiated treatment regimes. And this is some of our platelet data. In this case, we looked at 91 patients from our clinical collaborator who treated long COVID patients that he identified as having, having clotting pathology with anticoagulant regime. So just a disclaimer, I'm not a clinician, so I can't go much into what he used and why he used it, but it's a triple anticoagulation therapy. And th these patients, 80% uh, of them, and it was obviously just a snapshot, reported that most of the most prevailing symptoms were much better after treatment. Uh, and here you could just see the patients filled in a PGIC scoring where they themselves report whether they feel better or not. And the average of 80% was reached where 80% um, of the individuals that we followed said that they felt better. Interesting for us, if the patient said that they felt better and the symptoms uh, was not so severe, the microclots as well as their uh, platelets were significantly reduced. The microclot formation and platelets were not as hyperactivated. So this gave us quite a, a nice result where we looked at the, the PGIC score before and after treatment. And when patients say they felt better, they actually indeed looked better as well under the microscope. Um, so here's just an overview of what our thoughts are. So just to bring together some of the major elements of what we have seen. So we believe that as we all do, long COVID is an extremely complex disease where ischemia, hyperperfusion injury might be driven by platelet hyperactivation, fibrin microclots, circulating inflammatory molecules, as well as antibodies and autoantibodies. And ultimately, these pathologies suggest that long COVID might be, in fact, a thrombotic endothelitis that we should focus on and try to, to treat as well as looking at viral persistence and all of the other um, immune-related um, issues that these patients might have. I wish to also turn your attention to the February 2022 U.S. government document, the GAO, where microclot presence, viral persistence, autoantibodies, together with organ damage, were recognized as central pathologies to look into in finding answers to long COVID. 
at the U.S. National Academies of Sciences meeting earlier this month, where I was also um, giving a presentation, the chief medical officer of the FDA again referred to this document and showed this specific um, slide as well, suggesting that this should be still be a key focus in um, searching for answers for long COVID. Again, microclots were noted as a central pathology to look into. I'm very happy to report that our work was also featured in science as well as in nature and the beginning of the year also in National Geographic. So just to end off this presentation, I um, have some take home messages from what we have found. And uh, we believe that the relevance of receptor inflammatory marker interactions and including in this is also autoimmune reactions may be driving the disease pathology. And there's also a relevance of direct protein, protein interactions in clotting pathologies in long COVID. And perhaps there's a place for novel methods in the diagnosing of well-known as well as new diseases like long COVID. And here I would like to include use the use of fluorescence microscopy, perhaps an automated system, proteomics, which might not be a point of care, obviously, as we know it's difficult to do, but it might give us some more information. And then definitely a place for imaging and typical normal flow cytometry. And then there might even be a place for novel point of care technologies to study um, the, the flow the, the, and, and the clotting um, propensity in individuals with these type of diseases. Thank you very much. And thank you very much again for asking me to present our results at your wonderful meeting. Well, thank you very much for this outstanding um, talk on platelets and the consequences. Are there questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. So my question is if uh, these changes are really uh, COVID specific or we can translate maybe this knowledge also to other uh, infection diseases. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much for this question. I totally agree with you. This has got a lot of. Sorry, I'm hearing feedback. Um, so, just are you hearing feedback as well? Is it okay now? Okay, so um, I, I think it's a very valid question that, that you're asking here. I think clotting pathologies and um, platelet hyperactivation and microclot formation is not only a, uh, a phenomenon that is true to long COVID. What was so striking for me was the, the size and the sheer volume of the microclots, and that might be related to the spike protein. And then platelet hyperactivation as well. I've never seen the amount of platelet hyperactivation in any other disease. As I mentioned with MECFS, we've noted microclot formation there as well, as well as platelet hyperactivation. But those patients were collected, samples were collected, they, we know they did not have COVID. So we do see microclot formation in these conditions as well. Interestingly, previously, long before COVID, we actually looked at LPSs and LTAs from, from bacteria. And we could actually induce microclot formation and platelet hyperactivation um, using bacterial inflammagens. So I think it is um, perhaps at this stage and perhaps COVID opened up the, the scenario for us to further look at how clotting pathologies might look like in various um, infectious diseases. And it might give us an idea if there's EBV or any other of the virus bacteria that is known to be um, involved in conditions like MECFS, um, that might give us a, a place to, to search for treatments um, if we have widespread clotting and platelet pathology, which will eventually result in a thrombotic endocellitis in these individuals too. Can I ask another question? It's actually well known that um, viruses can host in platelets and reproduce themselves in this. Is this known for COVID? Um, we were actually just ha having a discussion last night with a few of our collaborators um, in the US from Harvard and from Yale and um, in, in our uh, meetings. And we 
I've also thought that this might be a very important uh, avenue to look into. I myself have not found, I, I have not looked whether they, platelets might harbor um, uh, the, the, the virus or spike protein inside them, but it's probably a, a really good research question. And um, I think there are some of the researchers in, in our wider community of long COVID that plan, that are planning to look into this. Um, also, perhaps in looking into the mega carrier sites, what's happening with a viral spike protein virus itself inside the mega carrier sites and perhaps inside the bone marrow. So I haven't looked, but I think it's really a good idea to, to look. Well, if there are no further questions, thank you very much again. Have a good day in South Africa. Thank you. And, um, thank you.